Why are wages so low? Can China become rich? And are central banks doing too much? These are some of the biggest economic questions facing our time. Economist and broadcaster Lindy Yu draws upon the ideas of some of the most well-known economists in history to try to help us to understand and tackle these pressing issues. Dr Yu is the author of a new book, The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. I'm pleased to say that she joins me now. Linda, thanks so much for coming in. Perhaps you could just start by telling us why you decided to write this book and what it's all about. It marries, I think, two interests. So one is, of course, trying to understand our biggest economic challenges. It's something that I've done as an economist, as a broadcaster, reporting from all over the world. And the other is actually my own personal interest, which is I really like biographies. Um, so reading about the lives of seminal thinkers who've changed the world just seemed like a really exciting prospect. And then getting to take their lives, their ideas, um, finding out where the ideas came from, and then picking out the bits that can help us resolve some of our biggest questions today. And how did you go about choosing who to include and also more importantly probably more difficult who to exclude? Mm. Yeah it's very difficult. Um, this book predominantly tries to answer the question of why countries grow or why they don't grow. Um, so questions around development but also the quality of growth. So it's about what makes up markets, when markets work, when markets fail. So it's a very macro book. So the great economists who are in the book range from Adam Smith from two centuries ago who was the first during the Industrial Revolution to tell us what the market consisted of and how it was governed by the invisible hand all the way through to the new institutional economics pioneers like Douglas North writing in the 20th century who try to explain where economic models have failed to help us um, eradicate poverty, uh, raise most countries into a better standard of living. Um, and so it's about trying to understand um, the, how our society is organized and importantly not just the speed of growth but also what determines our quality of life. So there's also thinkers that have um, not just done questions around how the um, economic system is constituted, but also is inequality inevitable, which is also one of the chapters. Now, a lot of what you talk about in your book seems very relevant to exactly what's going on in the news flow right now. And I'm thinking about Adam Smith. You mentioned the fact that his dad was a customs officer, so he's very familiar with tariffs. You said that Smith viewed protectionist trade policies as diametrically opposed to the efficiently operating markets. I'm wondering what Adam Smith tells us about Trump view on protectionism there? Mm. Well Adam Smith's view was very clear. He didn't think that adding distortions to trade, so that could be tariffs, could be a preferential trade agreement even in his view, um, were something that he saw both through his father's work and his own later career as a customs official in Scotland um, distorted um, the decisions around who to trade with um, and what to trade. And to him, that was inimical to the idea of the invisible hand, where market forces of supply and demand should determine what gets produced and then sold at which quantity. And in fact, the most, I would say, um, interesting um, fact about the Wealth of Nations, which is a seminal work published in 1776, it was designed to influence America's war of independence. And he believed that it wasn't. Um, it wasn't efficient to have a colony such as the United States that wanted, obviously, to leave the British Empire. He thought it would be better for Britain to trade with a independent United States. He saw no benefit in trying to keep them in this colonial relationship. So in other words, Adam Smith said, you should really just trade with um, whoever you wish, countries should not be imposing barriers. Now Adam Smith wasn't the only one to talk about trade. Another key economist that you talk about is David Ricardo, the father of international trade. He talks a lot about comparative advantage. And I'm wondering, that one of the questions you pose is about whether trade deficits matter. And I think that's very interesting given the fact that Donald Trump has got this real issue with the $375 billion deficit that the US has with China, trying to reduce it by 100 billion dollars. Does he have a point or and do trade deficits matter? Trade deficits only matter um, if it reflects an underlying weakness in the economy. So 
if a country might struggle, for instance, with um, paying for its trade deficit, which is obviously when imports exceed exports, um, then you might start to say, well, actually, um, there's something not quite a sound about that economy. That's not a position the United States um, is in. And in fact, David Ricardo's theory um, essentially says the trade position is a reflection of an economy's productivity, efficiency, strengths, and weaknesses. So it would be wrong to focus on trade. You should focus on making your economy more competitive. But he was also writing about free trade. Free trade, of course, doesn't exist. So to the extent that the world's biggest exporter of services, which is America, and Britain's actually the second biggest exporter of services, both countries run a surplus in exporting services, but an overall trade deficit because they import more manufactured goods than they sell of services. But one of the reasons that might be the case is because services trade is not as liberalized globally as manufactured goods trade, which is governed by the World Trade Organization. So if uh, Donald Trump could get China to open up its markets further, especially in services, it could actually help reduce the trade deficit. And that's probably going to be more effective than imposing tariffs or taxes, although one gets the sense that he's using tariffs and taxes to get the Chinese to the table to bargain for greater opening. Now let's move on to another economist in your book, that's John Maynard Keynes. Do you think that his theories help to allay concerns about rising debt in the US? Because we heard overnight from the Congressional Budget Office that the US debt is set to rise to a trillion dollars in 2020 because of this increasing spending and the tax cuts. How does Keynesian theory play out there? Keynes would argue that the, to the extent the infrastructure investment, although in the US tax bill, I think it's mostly about tax cuts. It's not really about infrastructure investment. Um, he would argue that when you have an economy which is underinvested, um, you, should use, um, you should use government investment to offset the deficit in the deficient um, elements of domestic demand, which is domestic investment. Uh, but if an economy is not in recession, um, his argument wouldn't be for deficit spending. Um, he argues that austerity is a policy for boom times. So he doesn't have an unbridled view that you should have government spending um, in whatever form. He was a strong uh, proponent of this idea that, for the most part, economies are not operating at full employment because savings doesn't automatically become investment. So he thought government should take a much stronger role in that respect. So Trump also has an infrastructure plan um, that's very similar to what we see in Europe, which is trying to boost investment by bringing in private money. John Maynard Keynes probably wouldn't have thought that private money was necessary, especially during an era where interest rates are very low and real interest rates are negative. However, he probably wouldn't say no to that if it meant that there could be a boost to especially infrastructure investment, which pays off dividends over the longer term and could do what's called crowding in. So in other words, it makes private investment more productive, more profitable, um, like for instance a telecoms company um, could do better business within a country where you had good telecoms infrastructure. You had a fiber network, chances are you'll deliver faster 5G services. So one of the other economists in your book, you managed to squeeze in a woman there impressively, was Joan Robinson. And she looks at one of the most, the biggest economic problems in your view of our time, which is the fact that wages are so low. You mentioned a number of different pressures, whether it's from technology to the gig economy. And I'm wondering whether, what we can learn from her about how to improve wage growth going forward. Her solution would be to increase competition. So she was the pioneer of imperfect competition. So unlike the classical economists who believe that markets are perfectly competitive, Joan Robinson writing in the 1930s, she was a follower of John Maynard Keynes, believed that just as you don't have economies that write themselves, um, you also don't have uh, perfectly competitive markets. But what that means is firms can have monopsony power, so that means they could pay workers less than what their output is worth. And I think that question is probably the single one that most resonates in lots of economies um, that are developed. So, for instance, um, 
uh, in a, when I interviewed uh, President Obama's chief economic advisor, he said the question he was asked most by the U.S. president was what is happening with wages? Because in America, wages have been stagnant for 40 years, and it's been 20 years in Germany and Italy. So looking at how markets are imperfect could help uh, reduce the disconnect between productivity and wage growth, which normally go together. But that hasn't been the case for, like I said, the last few decades. So Robinson's work would suggest we should look at minimum wages, we should look at other ways of reducing market barriers, dismantle uh, bargaining power if it's too strong on the part of employers, either through, say, trade unionism. Although she was always very um, skeptical of easy, clear-cut answers, um, she always believed that most economic issues are rooted in their context. So these are, generally speaking, things that one should look at. But obviously, the root of the issue could be very different in different countries. So technology automation is a bigger issue in America than it is in Britain. Um, trade unionism is a bigger issue in the continent um, than, for instance, um, in the United States. So I wanted to ask you a broader question about economics and forecasting because it's notoriously challenging and the Queen famously said at the LSE after the great financial crisis in 2007, why did nobody notice it? Do you think that forecasting is still important? Um, J.K. Galbraith, who is a very well-known um, American economist, he said that economic forecasting exists to make astrology look respectable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, economic forecasting is very difficult. The best forecasters say they can tell you basically what's happening now, um, but you still need extrapolations for things like governments to plan budgets. Um, but the problem with the global financial crisis is I think it reflected a silo mentality um, among economists who today are not generalists, unlike the great economists. So if you work on forecasting, you probably do not understand financial markets. So financial economics is its own stream of research, as is forecasting, as is general macro. So unless you can actually look across different streams, it'd be very difficult to see how something which is happening in one part of the economy feeds into um, what's happening in the wider economy. And that's clearly something that has to be rectified. So now, um, macroeconomists are building in more realistic um, ideas about financial markets assumptions into macro models. So micro foundations, including behavioral um, economics and behavioral finance, to try and see how firms actually interact are now feeding into how you would model the economy as a whole. Um, so that could be more helpful, but I still wouldn't necessarily think that you should rely on economic forecasting. Yeah. Um, it's a <laughs> very it's difficult thing to yeah. do. Yeah. Linda, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I've got so many more questions, yeah. but we've got to leave it there. Thank that you. was Linda Yu, author of The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. Thanks for watching IGTV. I'm Victoria Scholar, and we'll see you soon. Subscribe to IG for educational content, company insight, financial analysis and expert commentary.